I now yield four minutes to my good friend and colleague on the Rules Committee to speak in favor of the rule, as he did in the committee, Mr. Chip Roy. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. I appreciate the gentleman from Kentucky. Um, here we are, uh, engaging in the theater of the absurd yet again from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, just blatantly denying the power grab being carried out by the executive branch yet again. They don't seem to care so long as it suits their ends in terms of policy. Everybody who follows this understands that the court is almost certain to strike this down. We've already seen it happen in the Fifth Circuit. We are pretty clear about the extent to which this is an abuse of the Administrative Procedures Act, the extent to which this is an unconstitutional violation of our Second Amendment rights, and the court, no doubt, like the Fifth Circuit, will follow suit. And that's just the simple truth. Just like we expect the court to most likely rule that the president's power grab to extend a bailout for student loans will also be struck down. That is almost certainly true. But what is also true is that it is incumbent upon the United States Congress, the House of Representatives in particular, to stand up in defense of the Constitution. In defense, not just as might seem most apparent here, a defense of the Second Amendment, which this most certainly is, but in fact, a defense of separation of powers. That in fact, it is not the executive branch that makes law. When the Speaker of the House actually says that the President doesn't have power to do something and then refuses, as the previous Speaker, Speaker Pelosi did, to do anything about what the President is doing to exercise that authority unconstitutionally, as was the case with student loans, then it begs the question, do any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle give a wit about separation of powers or about the fact that it is a clear abuse of the power of the executive branch? The answer is no. That's the clear truth. They don't give a wit about that, nor do they give a wit about it here, because they like the outcome of the policy, the banning of a piece of plastic. That's the truth. But it's not really about the pistol braces, is it? Because really, that was in fact something created by Marine and Army veteran Alex Bosco inventing the pistol stabilizing brace to help his friend, a disabled combat veteran, at the shooting range. At the time, the ATF, President Obama's ATF, advised Mr. Bosco that his stabilizing brace did not convert a pistol into a short-barreled rifle. He relied upon that. Now here we are, a decade later, and the Biden ATF wants to reverse that by executive fiat. Not through the congressional uh, powers, not by legislation as was possible last summer when my colleagues had the House, the Senate, and the White House. No, no. They prefer to go ahead and use the unaccountable, unelected bureaucrat at the ATF to make policy. Well, we're here to say that that is a bad idea. It is a bad idea for the Republic. It is a bad idea for freedom. It is a bad idea with respect to our fundamental rights. The reality here is my colleagues on the other side of the aisle know full well what they want to do, and that it's not just ban an accessory. They want to ban firearms. They want to ban firearms from top to bottom, and this is a step to do it. Because I've always been taught, if your opponents say something, you should believe them. And that is the reality. I hope my colleagues on this side of the aisle will stand up for the CRA and send it over to the Senate, where it most assuredly might end up being a message amendment because the President of the United States will almost assuredly veto it because he doesn't care about separation of powers either. I yield back. Sir.